Hey, gearheads, and welcome to Garage Talk, a discussion about all things. Corey, I gotta interrupt you for just a second. We are officially recording in TF Studios for the first time ever on location in my garage. Garage Talk is finally being recorded 100% in the garage. You I'm excited. Are a it's it's monumental occasion. Absolutely, it is. <laughs> Shall we crack open a Coca-Cola? <laughs> if I had one, I would do it right now. <laughs> we are recording for the first time in our history from the, our garage studio, and uh, we're very excited about that. But this is Garage Talk, a discussion about all things automotive. I am your host, Corey. He is... Matt. And like always, this podcast will serve as a catalyst for a discussion on all sorts of topics that grind our gears rev our engines, or just need an extra bit of conversation. And on this week's episode, we're going to do a little bit of timely car news. Yeah. We are recording this on Monday, May 18th, and a couple auto manufacturers decided today was the day to drop some milestone information uh, as far as future models go. And so we're going to dive into a little timely car news and uh, dig into that deeper. But before we do, just want to take a moment to remind you but this is truly a discussion about all things automotive, and that discussion includes you, our listeners, our viewers. We want to hear back from you. You can do that on all three of our social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all at GT Garage Talk. Or you can just go to our website. It's got links to all our social medias. It's got links to our YouTube channel, our email address, all of that. It's gtgaragetalk.com. Made it super easy for you, but we truly love hearing back from you, our fans. But... Matt, we are here today in your garage studio yes. to talk about some car news. And the first thing that dropped uh, this morning was from Toyota, uh, right across the state, you know, just a hop, skip, and a jump w- away from us That's right. in Plano, Texas. Good two hour drive. Our friends at Toyota dropped the news of not one, but two new models for the 2021 model year. And so we'll dig into a little bit of that. You've got some pictures in front of you. You've got uh, the press release pulled up in front of you. First one we will touch on is an SUV I honestly thought was dead at this point, but they are um, bringing it back, and that is the Toyota Venza SUV. And it has grown. Yes. It's gotten taller. It's gotten a little longer. When they first came out, they they were kind of a... An overgrown car, almost. I always thought of them, and it's essentially what they were, as a frumpy... (laughs) That's the right word. A frumpy Camry, because they are built on the Camry platform. Um, I don't believe it had any extra ground clearance whatsoever. It it was just more or less a stylized Camry wagon, uh, more than anything else. and The uh, uh, Accord... What is it? Cross tour. Yeah. Uh, same same general idea. But the cross tour at least had some added uh, ground clearance underneath That's true. it. Yeah. So, but yeah. So uh, the Toyota Venza has uh, taken an interesting journey through uh, Toyota's product lineup. Uh, started as uh, basically a re- reskinned Camry, and it's growing up a little too. Yeah. Uh, it's becoming more mature. It definitely looks more refined. Uh, I'll go ahead and you can't see our faces on this episode, but I'll throw up a picture of uh, the new Venza on yeah. YouTube for those of you watching on YouTube. Uh, definitely a nice classy looking rig. Uh, that's how I would describe it. Toyota describes it as an elegant design meets cutting edge tech and comfort. Uh, and I, I would agree with that. I mean, it's very... Very sleek, very modern, very um, composed. Yeah, and so this one slots in between the Highlander and the RAV4. Okay. If you're kind of wondering size-wise where it fits in the lineup. And in today's SUV, CUV, crossover-hungry economy that we're in, uh, you can go back. We've done a whole episode on SUVs uh, and listen to that, but... uh, It was very interesting to me the way Toyota kind of let the Venza just kind of fizzle out uh, after they introduced it. And uh, to see them kind of pumping some energy back into maybe a forgotten SUV in their lineup, 
uh, it is nice to see, and it's nice to see more options. I am a fan of competition. Yeah. I am a fan of options. Definitely. Uh, free market, uh, doing what it does best, and so uh, I'm excited to see it. This one also capitalizes on another craze that is sweeping the automotive world, and that is electrification. Yes. So uh, this one is standard, without question. It is a hybrid. Uh, it has been hybridified. <laughs> I just came up with that one on the fly. We need to make that on a t-shirt and put it on our shop. But uh, yes, so it has been hybridified, uh, as Matt has termed and coined <laughs> for us uh, in this episode. But um, I'm looking through here. Uh, we've, we've got the website pulled up, kind of breaking down some of what's going on with it. It looks like the uh, the front wheels are driven by the 2.5 four-cylinder, and then the rear wheels are actually driven by electric motors. So this yes. is kind of a new take on... Uh, hybridification. Hi- hybridification, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> element of, um, of what hybrids have been thus far. Uh, of course, Toyota has been a leader in the hybrid segment for a long time. So Yeah, a little call or called the, uh, what is it, the Prius? 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 <laughs> Depending others, on yeah. which side of the ocean you're which on. Which side of the pond is, you know, Prius, Prius. Um, but, yeah. So to that point of uh, a unique take on the hybridification of SUVs, uh, you like that word, don't yes, you? Yes, <laughs> we're going to use it a lot in this episode. I can I can foresee that already. Um, that word, hybrid and cars, because of the Prius, has kind of been a taboo subject until, what would you say, about five years ago? It, when you started getting uh, crazy cars like the Ferrari, La Ferrari. Right. You get the, uh, what is it, the McLaren P1. Uh, what was Porsche's? 918 Spider. Yeah. Uh, so where you've got these crazy, insane supercars that have tons of power from their engines. And then, oh, by the way, here's some more power from right. electrification. Yeah. And. Yeah. Six, seven, eight hundred horsepower out of the, the turbocharged or naturally yeah. aspirated engines. And then here's an additional 300 to go with it. Right. Driving the front wheels or, yeah. That's the kind of hybrid I'm all about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way we should be doing hybrids. And when so it... when uh, Prius came along and became this mainstream uh, hybrid vehicle and the thing everyone thought of when they heard, I drive a hybrid. Right. Uh, that, that put that kind of boring commuter car stigma oh, yeah. on hybrid. Uh, well, but... I... I, I would completely agree with you. I think I think definitely those hypercars are what were needed to right. break the stigma of what the hybridification <laughs> means. <laughs> and what it could be for the automotive future. Yes. Because I don't think we are at the point, well, I know we are not at the point where uh, we can just drop all things internal combustion. Oh, um, yeah. No. And... That that's going to be hopefully knock on wood many years in the future as a tried and true internal I, combustion fan. Uh, I never want to see them go away. Yeah. I I am excited about things that Tesla has done and what they are spurring all the mainstream automakers to do, and uh, very excited about the direction things are going. But I think the hybridification of the automotive world is probably the most intriguing to me yeah. because it is literally the best of both worlds. It's all the fuel economy, the instant torque, all the power you can get out right. of electric, plus all the benefits of internal combustion. You don't have to stop every 300 miles and plug in for a half hour. Right. You, you can just go yeah. and drive. Well, uh, and Jay Leno said it. This has probably been eight or ten years ago. Um, said essentially that he embraces the hybrid and electric vehicles because it means that if that's what you're driving back and forth to work every day mm-hmm. you're saving the fuel you're helping with the environmental effects and then you get to go drive your 68 muscle car right. on the right. weekends and go have fun with it so you know there's there's definitely pros and cons to both but 
uh, but yeah, the, the, the hybrid element of, of the automobile is, is here to stay, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm afraid. So. And, and I've touched on it, but there are many people that are just too scared, too afraid, too unsure to fully jump off to the all electric at this point right and hybrid is the way that will get us there uh i won't tell our listeners exactly what it is uh because if it ever does happen i want it to be a surprise (laughs) uh but i've got my wife coming around on the idea of a fully electric vehicle a particular one uh that we've got our eyes on but we haven't pulled the trigger on it we're we're still exploring all options but i will say one of the concerns that she has about going all electric is a concern that pretty much everyone who hasn't already jumped ship right has and that is uh, range anxiety is mm-hmm. the best term for it and, and that is being able to know that you can get to where you want to go quickly and easily and you won't be stranded in the middle of nowhere with no electricity i loved absolutely loved the meme you put together of the picture of the last roll of toilet paper the struggle was real yes and you know with with the crap we've had going on no pun intended uh over the past few weeks uh with the virus garbage and the toilet paper shortage uh you compared the last roll of toilet paper to range anxiety of the electric vehicles it was a fantastic play on the situation it was wonderful God bless my parents. They bailed us out. They found some toilet paper, and uh, we we were spared uh, having to count our squares <laughs> <laughs> shortly after I took that picture. But yes, uh, range anxiety is a real thing, and I think the major barrier keeping a lot of people from jumping to electric vehicles. Add on top of that, um, I believe my wife and I have come to a mutual understanding on this fact that we will never own a vehicle that does not have a uh, service station in the town that will service it. Yeah. So uh, we learned kind of the hard way with our Mini Cooper. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Mini as a company was purchased by BMW, but still kind of does their own thing. Mini. Many as many. Yeah. Um, and so uh, when we had some certain issues come up with it, uh, we took it to the BMW dealership in town. They said, sorry, we can't read it. That's many proprietary stuff. And we're like, but BMW? They're so- they said, sorry, we can't. <laughs> and so they referred us to one of two uh, European automotive places in town. And anyway, long story short, uh, we have now come out of ownership of that many with, like I said, I believe the mutual understanding that we won't own another vehicle that we can't take to someplace locally in town right. any day of the week, except for Sunday, and have it fixed. So uh, while we do have a Tesla store in town, uh, getting them fixed, if yeah. anything were to go wrong, not great. And I've watched, uh, we've got some YouTube channels we watch. Uh, TFL Car did a whole series on uh, some body work after just a, a slight fender bender in a Model 3, and it took way too long oh, yeah. for them to get that thing repaired. Yeah. So uh, there there are some things keeping us from jumping into the all-electric bandwagon. But well, and, I mean, Mr. Musk keeps talking about, you know, we're talking about uh, up-to-date stuff with the new release today. Mr. Musk keeps talking about moving to Texas, so... You know, it may it may come sooner than later if uh, we shall see. If things so, continue the way they uh, are. So. The the last news report I saw as of this recording was that he was defying local authorities' orders and he was uh, reopening his California plant. Yep. So, um, but Texas is more than willing to have him and have all that business come. Uh, so we will see how far uh, down the rabbit hole we go with that. But. We're supposed to be talking Toyota Venza. You got any more interesting tidbits or thoughts uh, from this guy before we jump into our next car? Well, we mentioned the hybridification of yes. the vehicle. Uh, uh, just the big thing that stuck out to me was the uh, the standard electric on-demand all-wheel drive. So, right. again, the front wheels being powered by the gasoline engine, the rear wheels being powered by the electric motors. Um, and it is loaded out. Yeah. Well, of course, the press release is going to show you all the good stuff oh, of the man. top trim, but I will say, uh, I've always been, and this is 
very interesting coming from a GM fanboy. I've always been kind of critical of interiors of cars because yeah. that's where you spend all your time. And oh, yeah. if you don't appreciate the interior, uh, you're probably not going to appreciate the car. And uh, Toyota has taken some interesting turns. And uh, they've taken some wins. They've had some losses. But looking at the interior of this one, uh, I don't know what your thoughts are, but it's got some interesting designs. I kind of like it. It's uh, it's intriguing. Um, I'm noticing, uh, and again, this is on the press release page, so we get limited views right. of what the actual car is going to look like. But a lot of uh, you know soft textiles, mm -hmm. a lot of leather, a lot of nice sharp edges rolled in with the curves and things. Uh, lots and of LED. <laughs> then you have yeah, lots of LED, and then you have this rubber faux leather covered <laughs> center cover on the steering wheel and yeah. it it's just i don't know yeah they're trying to be fancy yeah so uh one last conversation point before we go on to our next vehicle because sure. we've spent enough time on uh this guy what are your thoughts as we're looking at the center stack of this free-floating tablet design of the infotainment screen everybody's putting tablets in their cars now yeah it's, i mean that uh I'll bring it up again. The new um, Cadillac with the 39-inch screen yes. across the front of that vehicle. What is the point? That's to flaunt your your money. It's incredible. Like <laughs> when and, you're and, driving an Escalade, it is all about style and presence. Ugh. And having that giant curved OLED screen in front of you in, in a Cadillac is yes, just to brag about all the money you've got and the technology at your disposal. All the money you wasted on another GM product. <laughs> <laughs> the one that's got me scratching my head is uh, the brand new Ford Explorer with their giant, was it 12.3, 12.9 inch tablet that they oddly stuck shooting up into the yeah. sky for, off that's... the dash. That, I think, is the most odd interpretation of this tablet design yeah. in a car. Yeah, this one on the on the Toyota is sideways, yeah. so it's a little less obstructive. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Tesla's got the big TV screen in the but middle of theirs. and For the most part, they're integrated, air quotes, integrated into... The, uh, Model S has it better than the 3 and the Model Y. The right. 3 and Y both have them kind of floating out there, but... Yeah, I'm kind of interesting. I'm kind of on the fence about the whole thing because, like, uh, I I have a particular brand of phone, <laughs> um, and I've had that particular brand of phone for a long time, right? Because it works well, right? But there are constantly updates. There are constantly mm -hmm. things about it that have to be refined. They have to be fixed. They have to be, uh, and this this probably dabbles a little bit into our technology conversation mm -hmm. so i won't go too far into it but if my car has to be updated every time i turn the key on that's going to get really annoying really fast like i, I want to get in my car and i want to hit the button to turn the radio on and go wherever i'm going doing whatever i'm doing i'm not you don't have that in problem in a 69 camaro z28 no you don't no you don't uh, <laughs> All Sometimes right. you have that problem in an 08 F-150, but only because of the 5.4 Triton under the hood. So, <laughs> Still bitter about that one, huh? A little. <laughs> yeah. A little. Yeah. Yes. So uh, if you want to know more about uh, the new Vinza from Toyota, be sure to check out our website. Uh, I will have a blog post up giving you all the news and information and pictures you would want to see on that. It's gtgaragetalk.com. But... Why don't we dive into the second new vehicle released today, uh, also from Toyota, also a family hauler, also hybridified. Yes. <laughs> and that is the Toyota Sienna minivan. Matt, we've talked a lot about minivans we on have. this podcast. We have. Uh, right. We kind of have a love-hate relationship with them. Yeah. We yep. both grew up being carted around in minivans. Yeah. They, they, uh, they hold a special... <laughs> dark creepy cold place in my heart but they're there they're yeah. I, I, I do love minivans um i will say the previous generations of i will say toyota minivans in general preceding the sienna have always had funky 
exterior styling. Uh, That's this, a nice word. This is the first <laughs> Toyota minivan that I actually would accept the styling of. I won't go out and buy one because I refuse to go out and spend money on a minivan as a millennial dad. But the styling on this one, uh, it, it it's interesting enough. It's edgy enough. You know what it looks like to me? What? Uh, and I know... I know in the uh, minivan world, this is done more often than what any of the manufacturers would admit to, yeah. but it looks like it's been combined with a couple of other vehicles, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, one of which would be the rear end of the vehicle we just finished talking yep. about, yep. Um, and the other would be uh, the Chrysler 300. Like, if you just take a quick glance at the Squint nose... Out a little. Yeah. The way the headlights wrap around, the way the grill is kind of open and crescent shaped, and then that huge mouth on the front of it. The, now that's an interesting one for me because Toyota is especially guilty of this with the new Avalon, and that is the. I'm gonna try and create a word on the fly here: the gigantification of the grill, <laughs> the automotive grill, yes. and. 90% of these giant grills that they're putting on cars now Are aren't, aren't even grills. Like, if you get up close to them, they're solid plastic. Yep. They're not letting any air through. Yep. And most of the time, the engine behind them doesn't need that much air in the first yeah. place. But well, And Lexus is equally as, well, as great a Toyota's fancy brother. Of, right. <laughs> uh, because the grills on the latest Lexus models are massive. Yes, and, and they just keep getting bigger. So it's interesting to me that here we have another grave offender of this giant grill. And for some reason to me, at least in pictures, it kind of works on this one. I don't it's know. It's not awful. It, I mean, I'm not It's gonna not say that awful. It looks, yes. I'm not going to say that it looks bad. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. It's entertaining. but yeah, For a minivan. You know. So... Uh, I will say, I, I'm going to go ahead and call out uh, the one outstanding feature on this. Like I said, I'll write a blog post on this one as well. That'll be on our website, gtgaragetalk.com. Uh, but the interesting feature I want to talk about was first seen in my automotive lifetime in our dear departed friend, the Pontiac Aztec. And that is easy the car refrigerator. <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? So. Oh, I didn't even notice it. <laughs> yes. Uh, you can now get a refrigerator in your Toyota Sienna minivan. Uh, available and onboard vacuum yes. and refrigerator. So the vacuum now has vacuum become almost brilliant. a given That's wonderful. Uh, for minivan culture. But now, yes, we are throwing uh, refrigerators in there. So for those unaware or who would rather block the Pontiac Aztec from their memory altogether, one of its... Selling features for the active lifestyle was the center console. You could lift the handle up and pull it out, and it was a removable cooler, but when it was plugged in, in the center console, you could plug it in, and it was a active refrigerator right there in your center console. And that was just one of the many active lifestyle features of the Pontiac Aztec. Interesting. And now, here we have a family rig, many years down the line. What are we? Thirty years removed from the Aztec, yeah. and it rears its head again. The onboard fridge. So I believe they've got some pictures if you scroll down far enough to suit of, a variety of lifestyles. I have a couple of things I want to pick on. About okay, this. go I'll, right I'll, ahead. I'll, I'll scroll down here and look at the pictures while I'm talking about it. Uh, the interior is beautiful yep. uh, I love the cockpit the whole open uh, center oh, what do you call it the center stack yeah the center stack the, the console and everything mm-hmm. the armrests here that again we've got that floating tablet floating tablet uh, one of my favorite features of minivans is armrests on the chairs yeah I think that ought to be an option on every vehicle everywhere um, it's I uh, it's just comfortable. Chevy Spark's got it. one. Do they really? <laughs> yeah, but only for the driver. So uh, <laughs> that's because the center console is like the size of a penny. But <laughs> well, whatever. you know. Um, so the biggest offender of this whole hybridified process to me is that they still, I, 
Estimated 33 combined miles to the gallon. Now, and I, I, I'll have to check with my dad for sure on this, but we had a 2000-2001 Grand Caravan with a 3.3 V6, and it got nearly 30 miles to the gallon in 2001. Right. Right, and then even five and six and seven years later, when we had it, it was still getting thirty miles to the gallon. We're not ta- that's a ten percent increase in twenty years. So, I've had that thought too because I've owned. I had an 07 Silverado. Uh, it was two wheel drive uh, with five three V eight in it, and I frequently could get over twenty mpg on that sucker. Uh, cruising the highways and I did pool work so I was uh, cruising all over East Texas uh, repairing pools and that thing and I would frequently get over 20 mpg on it yeah no problem like I remember watching it and the only active fuel tech it had on it and it was groundbreaking at the time was it had cylinder deactivation so it would cut off half the cylinders and go to v4 mode uh to save a little bit of fuel but other than that like it was a 5.3 liter v8 engine that just ran and uh here we are many years down the road and we're doing crazy things like putting aluminum on all swing panels or going like ford and going all aluminum all aluminum which creates more problems when it comes to repairs and Up you know costs and all uh, yeah it's <laughs> and if you've watched any Chevy commercial uh, damage <laughs> to the bed uh, but uh, there are just so many things that they've done to increase the cost of ownership the co- cost to entry into these vehicles um, and we're still playing around the same MPG mark to begin with. Yeah. Granted, the rigs have also grown much in size oh, yeah. uh, as they've done this because I know that the uh, brand new Silverado lost 300 pounds uh, but also grew in size. So it got bigger and lighter, but they also, like I but said... they made it bigger. Yeah, and aluminum swing panels and all, all that good weight-saving right. measures and well, stuff the, like the, that. The nose on those things is like pushing a brick through the air, too. Yes, so. which... Or, as the designers would like you to say, pushing a fist through the air. Oh, is that what yes. it's supposed to be? That that was the design theme, was a fist punching through the air. So. Interesting. But, yeah, so I've wondered that. And even when you're talking new car prices. Yeah. Because, so, I'm sitting here, sitting in your garage, staring at my 2013 Chevy Cruze, that the only option I got on it was the paint color. And yeah. I believe they may have thrown in the net in the trunk but no options no frills and i got out the door for 23 on it yeah and uh for 23 nowadays you're not getting much no you're, you're getting a much smaller vehicle with with much less and it's because they keep adding technology that we expect as standard they keep uh, you know then there's inflation obviously but there are so many other things forces at work here as right. well that uh, we have to gripe about as car lovers. So, but yeah, back to your gripe with fuel economy. Here we are bragging about what was it, 33 mpg, yeah. and back in 01, we did it without all of this. Yep. So, yep. Uh, it, it's just the demands of the modern world and all the stuff we yeah. want to carry with us well, and big old american vehicles whether we want to admit it or not they're getting bigger they are every getting bigger. generation all the time they're getting bigger uh, and now ford is talking about bringing out a new downsized pickup uh, yeah. i don't know if you've heard anything yes. about that yes. um, i'm incredibly intrigued about that to see where it where it fits in it'll probably be about the size of the previous generation long deceased ford ranger which is the size Mid-sized right. trucks should be. Like, that's what I grew up thinking about. Like, the old Chevy S10s and yeah. the Ford Rangers that were just tiny little... It's it's supposed to... Sh- about town. Yeah. It's supposed to share a platform with the uh, the Focus yeah. and the uh, the Transit Connect. The little so box. It, so, it's really more like a small... Uh, what was it? Ford Ranchero was the equivalent to the El Camino. So, it's going to be car-based. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah, it, it will be car based. So maybe we create a new segment now. Uh, 
crossover utility truck. <laughs> Would that be a CUT? Who knows? Because uh, it's not a car. It's not a pickup. It's no know. more a pickup than the uh, Honda Ridgeline. So. We interrupt your regularly scheduled programming for a word from our sponsor. And now, back to the episode. More news. <laughs> what else dropped today, Corey? Well, this is one I believe you are going to be most thrilled and most excited about. And ironically, I've seen equal amounts of posts on all three of these vehicles on my news feed on Facebook and Instagram. And that is the world premiere of the new Porsche. Porsche, excuse me, Porsche uh, 911 Targa. So, would you it, like to enlighten our listeners as to what exactly is a poor Porsche 911 Targa and what is the importance to the brand? The uh, the Targa name, uh, I would have to look for sure. It was either the 60s or 70s when the Targa name uh, first came to the 911. And it has most everything to do with the top that uh that 1965 is 65 there you go good old google um 1965 the target top came to the 911s and it is simply the removable section between the top of the windshield and the top of the back glass so it's a corvette it's a corvette coupe no. they've always been targets no no, no. Corvette was either convertible or hardtop until recently. The the Corvette stole the idea from Porsche. That's what it was. That one actually is true because uh, there for a while <laughs> Corvettes were T-tops before they became full fledged Targets. But yeah, I believe see. it was the C4 in 1984 uh, that was the first Targa see, top. That's 20 whole years. Yeah. Like GM is way behind the curve on that. One. No. Uh, that's but that's primarily what makes it a Targa. Uh, there's, I'm sure. Uh, I will read. Reading through here. I will read Porsche's uh, Go blurb for here. The distinguishing feature of the Targa remains its innovative, fully automatic roof system, and just like the legendary original Targa model from 1965, it features a characteristic wide roll hoop, a removable roof section above the front seats, and a wraparound rear window. The root remove. The roof can be comfortably opened and closed in just 19 seconds. So it, it's the best of both worlds. It's a convertible. It's a coupe. It's all of it. You can have open air. You can have nice, secure, closed in. You don't have to worry about in today's world and with your car history, rollovers. <laughs> we don't have to talk about that. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, it, it, it really is the best of both worlds. And I know a lot of car enthusiasts that are just gushing over this new model. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I love it. Uh, and you just mentioned a minute ago, cars are getting bigger. The 911, oh. two or three, three or four years ago, the wheelbase stretched, the track width stretched. Uh, but, oh, my goodness, it fits this car so well. Uh, all the right curves in all the right places. <laughs> That wrap around glass, the bar, the, the extra wide bar, everything mm -hmm. about this car is right when it comes to a sports car. So I had to ask you, while we we're talking 911s, which one would you have? Has this one swayed you? Uh, would you I... have the Targa? Would you have a Turbo, Turbo S? Uh, would it GT3, GT2? Where, where are you going? I, I, I think I would, uh, man, that'd be a hard choice. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Like, because I, I would love to have the turbo engine. Mm -hmm. um, I love the track capability of the GT2, GT3. The um, boy racer looks of them. <laughs> yeah, um, but as far as a car that I would be just as happy spending the day at the track with uh, as I would getting in and driving across the state of Texas in, I think the 911 Targa would be where yeah. I would settle in on. And and it's uh, maybe next year or the year after they'll come with a turbo Targa. Yeah. yeah. Uh, would be the best of, of all the worlds. But. Yes. I'll go back on this only to say, and, and they haven't paid us to be a sponsor or anything <laughs> like that, uh, but 
the built versus bought thing comes into play here. Yeah. Because the Singer 911 yeah. would be where my money would go if I had <coughs> half a million dollars to spend <laughs> on a vehicle. Uh, it's, I, I just... If you are spending uh, <coughs> half a million dollars on a vehicle... Uh, what else have you spent money on by that point? <laughs> no kidding. Uh, much bigger house and probably a much bigger garage for our studio. studio. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we would be in this setting if we're spending half a million dollars on a car. At, at the point. very least, it would be an air-conditioned garage, right? Yes. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I do. I, I love the look of this new car. It is absolutely beautiful. Uh, refinement without a whole lot of changes um the the profile is right the one back of, the one ample the, back side is uh, right it does have an ample back it side. is beautiful one of the things that i believe porsche started uh design wise that i absolutely love and now kia of all automakers has stolen and run with it and uh it's the look of that quad LED signature yes. that you've got when it's staring at you. The, yes. the running lights, uh, it, it almost, I, I don't even know what it reminds me of. Uh, it For some reason, it makes me think of a barrel of a gun, but uh, just there's something to having those four eyes staring yeah. at you, which really you've got eight, so maybe it's a little spider staring back I, at yeah, you. Yeah, that's, that's kind of where my yeah. mind goes. I, I think they introduced that on the 918 yeah. Uh, hypercar when it came out, and it's it's stuck around, and I'm I'm very okay with it sticking around. Yeah. It's a beautiful look. So that that's one thing that I really love that they've done here recently, and another uh, going back to something we kind of got on the last two vehicles about, which play in a completely different realm, uh, <laughs> family haulers, and that is the infotainment screen. This one has also got a very large infotainment screen, but Porsche can really put an interior together oh, well. And this one is of no exception, and I love that you can get red leather. Yes. <laughs> uh, I am a fan of color inside, outside, wherever you can put it in a vehicle, but I love the red leather on this one. I love the integrated look of this giant touchscreen. Um, about the only thing I don't like on the interior of this car, and uh, I've heard it ex explained and described by uh, none other than uh, our buddy uh, Doug DeMuro as the face shaver gear selector. <laughs> uh, it, it looks like a Remington or a Norelco shaver just sitting in the middle of the center stack and that's how you change uh, from park to drive or at wherever you want to go. And there's no better way to describe the look of it than an electric shaver. Yeah. And uh, I, that is the only demerit in my book <laughs> on the styling of this thing. Uh, I, I should have read a little further before I started talking about a turbo model. Yeah. Um, this is... The turbo model. And it's a twin turbo. Nice. It's a It's a bi-turbo boxer engine. Nice. Um, and because it's German, I have to translate the kilowatts <laughs> to horsepower, which I was... In the process of doing... Of frantically Googling. <laughs> just a minute ago. So, 331 kilowatts comes out to uh, 443 horsepower. Nice. Uh, which is plenty. All packed and weighted down over oh, the rear man. wheels. Yeah. So, uh, in a max torque of 530 newton meters, uh, it says up 30 newton, meter, 30 newton meters from the pre uh, predecessor. Um so it's, I mean, it's got all the right stuff. Yeah. Uh, I don't have to wait till next year for a turbo model because yeah, it's go. already there. Yeah. Where do I sign? So, um, first, there's somebody uh, not in our garage studio right now that you might have to converse with yeah. over the uh, yeah. whole idea of. Probably so. <laughs> uh, she'd love to drive it. Um, yes. And then the first payment would come and she'd tell me to take it back. So. <laughs> Where does this thing belong? Not here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You so. borrowed this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said, if you want to learn any more about it, the specs on it, we'll go in detail on our website in a blog post, gtgaragetalk.com. 
Uh, Matt, any further thoughts before we sign off on this week's episode? Not today. Uh, other than hybridification. Yeah, how to, I, I, we got to coin that like trademark it. Trademark it so that it's it's our because everybody's going to be saying hybridification yes. in the near future, yes. right? Uh, it'll be all over YouTube. Um, when I can get Cletus McFarland to say hybridification <laughs> on one of his YouTube videos, I know I'll, I will have arrived. Um, no, the uh, the Bronco and the Mustang Mach-E. Uh, Mach-E. <sighs> and something else. Uh, there are three Ford vehicles that were set to release this spring, mm. and we are over halfway through the last month of spring, yep. and there are no Ford vehicles yet. Nope. And the word is it will be this fall before we hear anything else about them. Yeah. Um, the Rona has struck again, and I just I we have been waiting on the Bronco. They have been talking about the Bronco for so many stinking f- years, like four or five years, yeah. and I'm I'm over this wait <laughs> for this truck. I'm so over it. Well, I will say, on a positive note, uh, we are as I said before, we're recording May 18th, Monday night, and. Uh, we are, as a nation, taking a turn. Factories are starting to open up, not yeah. only here in America, but elsewhere. So I reported uh, on our Instagram uh, page when uh, VW opened one of their German plants again, uh, where they build the Golf. And so factories are starting to open. Uh, people are going back to work. So praise the Lord, yeah. life is starting to whir back into existence again. And uh, we're just hoping that all of you, our listeners, stay safe. Yes. Uh, be smart about your interactions. Be smart about where you go, what you do. Uh, but, yes, there have definitely been some tolls on the greater automotive industries. And we know absolutely that some of you all have been hit personally by this. And just know that our th- thoughts and prayers are with you on that. Uh, we joke. We plug our merchandise and all the ways you can support us but this truly is a free podcast and will always be a free podcast support us if you wish but uh, the idea is that we are bringing news and entertainment to you our listeners this is as we always say a discussion about all things automotive and it's not just between matt and i Uh, it is with you our listeners our viewers and we truly love hearing back from you we want to see Hashtag hybridification trending <laughs> yes. on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram yes. by the end of the week. Yes. So our question of the week this week is uh, more or less a general question. And what is it that, that you love, hate about these three new models? Uh, yeah. They're very different in scope and in what they are built to do. But what are your thoughts on the new Venza, the new Sienna minivan, and the Porsche 911 Targa? And uh, sound off, let us know what you think about it. You can hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all at GT Garage Talk. You can go to our website. It's got links to all the ways that you can get back to us. And you can even check out our YouTube channel if you aren't already on there watching us uh, as we speak. And that is GTGarageTalk.com. And we just truly love hearing back from you, our listeners. And until next time, bye.